I'm one of the SMEs at EGMAT and uh, welcome to the SC session. Um, to help me here with this session today, I have Payal who will be at the support um, and I have Mansi also here who would be taking care of all your course related questions or anything else that you would want to know other than your subject matter queries. Okay, so we do have a, a vote, um, a, a poll on the screen that says, when do you plan to take the GMAT test? And most of you are within 45 plus days. And that's, in fact, even, you know, 31 to 45 days. So um, that's a good, uh, you have enough time in your hand to understand what it takes to ace uh, GMAT SC. And you definitely, if you want to learn about our world famous uh, meaning based approach you are definitely at the right place so let's uh dive into the session right away um generally um you know this session has two parts the first part is all about subject matter we are going to talk about the eg mat three step process we are going to demonstrate it also um with uh, through four official questions that we are going to solve here today um just to let you know all these four questions are 700 level questions and we will solve all these questions by using the eg mat meaning-based approach and the whole idea is to show it to you the efficacy of the process and how important it is to actually have a unified uh, scientific approach that can be applied to all sorts of questions in GMAT SC. The last 20 minutes we have reserved for any questions that you may have for us. It can be anything subject related, admission related, strategy related, and Rajat will take care of all those questions. So roughly we are looking at a session that's about two and a half hours long. Also, here I would quickly like to talk about there are two different kinds of uh, learning process. You know, one is the book-based architecture and the other is the private tutoring-based architecture. Um, both the architectures are pretty self-explanatory. But here at EGMAD, we are actually kind of, you know, amalgamated these two and come up with our, our, um, our process, our teaching method that is even more effective than these two architectures. And we have proved the efficacy of our teaching method time and again. GMAT Club bears the uh, testimony to that through all the success stories that we have delivered. And um, you can also look them up at, um, you know, on LinkedIn and other social medias. You can also subscribe to um, eGMAT YouTube channel to regularly read our success stories. With that, let's move on to our very first official question now before i show you the question i have a poll here that says question one right at the end of the poll you can see the option still solving so please click on this option right now still solving don't click on any other answer choice because you've still not seen the question. Now, why are we doing this still solving thing over here? We are not going to time you. There will be no timer used in this session. So it's not that you've got to finish every question under 90 seconds or, um, you know, under uh, uh, two minutes or whatever. The idea here is to give you all the time that you require to solve a question, but basically we are going to prove to you the efficacy of understanding the meaning or all of the meaning-based approach. So, so I just don't want any one of you to say that, okay, if I would have had more time, I could have solved this question. Timing cannot be the reason to not solving a question correctly. It's actually the outcome and we will prove that to you through this session. So that's why if you click on still solving, uh, that way I will know how many of you are engaged with us in this session. Also, I would request 
all of you to participate in these polls because for the next two hours i'm the only one who's going to speak so for our to keep our communication two-way you know participate in these polls so that i know that at what level you are also um, involved with us. I have 131 participants in this session, and I welcome each one of you. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, also, I would request that please participate in these polls so that you can get the maximum out of it. And you know, it keeps it keeps the speaker going on as well. I mean, <laughs> uh, you will be my source of inspiration and enthusiasm, right? So let's just do this. Uh, question number one, could I have a little bit more participation? Uh, the number right now stands at 69. If we could push it to 75, those of you who have still not chosen, still solving, if you could just get to that, click on it, and there we go. Now comes the very first question on your screen. It is an official question, a 700 level question. Um, it, it actually comes in OG advanced, okay? So solve this question by the method that you use now. And uh, yeah, then I'll see you at the other side of the poll. Thank you. All right, most of you are done solving this question here. Uh, more, more than 80% people are done. So those who are still working on this one, I would request you to make a, make a choice. 
click in click on on click on an answer choice and then let's move on so that we can start our discussion let's take 10 more seconds to finish this one up last three seconds all right so i still see eight people on still solving if you guys can just make a selection and move on any last minute takers just click on an answer choice and let's move on all right so i'm ending the poll here all right so before we demonstrate how we at egmat would solve this problem um, I'll talk about a general process that most of the te test takers adopt to, um, you know, solve this question. They will read the question first, the overall slackening of growth and productivity. Why am I reading so fast in the beginning? Because that's how generally people read the sentence. The, the non-underlined portion sentence, they think it's, it's all fine. You know, I, I really don't need to read it too much. So they would just go, the overall slackening of growth and productivity is influenced less by government regulation. Okay, something is influenced less by government regulation. So probably, you know, we will see then although that is uh, significant for specific industries like mining. Okay, so these government regulations could be important for some other industries. Now I hit the than portion. So I know that, yes, there is a comparison less X than Y. So then the coming to an end of a period of rapid growth in agricultural productivity. So do we do understand that the sentence is presenting a comparison and then over here, and let me quickly bring my pen over here so that I can annotate here. Okay, so we see less by here. And so we understand that, okay, um, I have then but it should be than by to keep the parallelism going with the comparison. So obviously choice A and choice B are out, right? Now we have to deal with choices C, D, and E. Now, by the coming to an end of sounds too wordy. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, we, we don't talk like that. By ending, okay, maybe. Um, but when you come to choice E, that's, well, that's what catches your attention. And you say, yeah, by the end of, it's, it sounds very neat, an expression that we use in our regular conversation, be it written or, you know, uh, spoken or whatever. And so by the end of is, it, it sounds right. It looks neat. It, no grammatical error I see over there. So yes, we choose choice E and, you know, that's it done we have solved this question correctly but have you really solved this question correctly choice e is not the correct answer i'm quickly broadcasting the result over here to show you that 36 percent of you the majority of the class actually landed up on choice e choice e is the most popular answer choice for this question right now but choice e is not the correct answer so what happened what is going on with this sentence before i begin the process i'm just, i'm letting you know again that this is an official guide advanced question and um, the the learning that we are going to take here is that because of that splits method, you know, the pattern recognition method that, okay, A, B, yes, A, B is out. I We understand that. But then we had to deal with C, D, and E, but without any, you see, we did not wait to understand the meaning of the sentence. There was no logical uh, thought process behind making that selection for choice E, but that's not going to work in difficult questions and let me tell you also that the more this uh, uh, you know the more the difficulty level rises 
these sentences start playing on the logic of the sentence and not so much on the grammar of the sentence and that's what we need and that's why meaning based approach is so important um also if you want to achieve that 90th percentile in sc you need an approach which is consistent for all types of questions and just by that one method you can solve every single sc question and you need to make that approach intuitive you need to um internalize that process in order to ace gmat sc at egmat how we would solve this question the very first thing that we do is that we break the sentence down into smaller chunks as you can see on the screen now why do we do this we do this only to make sure that we are reading the sentence properly it's a pretty long sentence and it has a few layers in it right a few contextual uh, information and if we do not pause at the right places to read this to read these chunks and process the information and as we read along we assimilate the meaning taken out of these little chunks we will never be able to understand what the author is trying to say think about it e even when we want to communicate right we first conceive of the idea we first conceived of the thing that or the logic that we want to convey and then accordingly we choose words to express that logic to other people and that's how conversation takes place that's that's how uh, you know be it your writing piece or you talk to somebody we first conceive of an idea and that's the reason why it is so very important to first understand that what is it that the author wants to communicate with uh, wants to communicate to us what is it that he wants us to know and that's why we our first step in meaning based approach is to read slowly by pausing at certain places so that we can understand the meaning and assimilate it at the same time as we read along so this this is exactly what we are going to do here the overall slackening of growth in productivity is influenced so the words that you see in blue are the subjects and the expressions in green are the verbs so uh, the overall slackening you know uh, the dwindling of growth in productivity is influenced less by government regulation so the moment i read this expression over here less by i know there is a comparison which means that the author is going to present two reasons that have influenced the overall slackening of the growth right there there should be two uh, two factors and that's why one factor is more important than the other right so the first this this particular part talks about the first factor which is less influential less important right less by government regulations okay we understand that government regulation has got something to do with the slackening of growth but not as much as this other factor which we have not read as of yet continuing although that is significant for specific industries like mining now this that is talking about government regulation the author is saying well yes um there is a contrast coming in here because of the usage of the word although and the author is saying that yes by the way you know um government regulation can be very very important for certain specific kind of industries and through like the author has given us the example also however the overall slackening has not been influenced so much by government regulation so that's the contrast that this part of the sentence is talking about that yes government regulation can be significant for certain industries but the overall slackening of growth in productivity has not been influenced so much by government regulation as um it has been influenced by this other factor and what is that other factor this is where we read that second factor and that second factor is than 
the coming to an end of a period of rapid growth in agricultural productivity. So, sorry about that. So, uh, so a period has been coming to an end. So what is that period? The period of rapid growth in agricultural productivity. This period, this particular period has been coming to an end and that has affected the overall slackening of growth in productivity way more than the government regulation. This is what the sentence is trying to say. And we do spend this kind of a time to understand the original sentence. Mind you, you know, a lot of people say, why are we spending so much time just looking at one answer choice? By the way, original sentence does not only provide us with one of the answer choices. It provides us with the idea, the logic, the information, the story that the author wants to convey to us. One of the answer choices or choice A just is just a part of this whole story. Unless we understand the whole story, there is no way that we can understand just a part of it. And that's why it's so very important to focus on the entire story before we start looking at the little parts that can be plugged in into the story logically. All right. So when we understand this, what you see on your screen is what we call aspects. Now, what are aspects? Aspects are those logical piece, pieces of information that the author wants to convey through this particular sentence. And it's very, very clear to us because this is what we have extracted by spending this kind of time by reading the sentence in chunks, right? So now that we understand the meaning of the sentence very well, we do figure out that there is the comparison between these two entities in the sentence. Now, why do people get questions wrong, right? Over here, if, if I take you back to my previous slide, if you really see a very small portion of the sentence is underlined and it is very, very crucial to understand the meaning of this particular underlined portion. Um, just a second. I'm trying to look for a poll that I'm going to bring in here. Okay, here. So coming back to what I was saying is that it's very, very important to actually decode the meaning of this, this phrase, the coming to an end of. And my question to you next is about your understanding of this particular phrase underlined in the sentence. So you can see another poll on your screen. Please click on an appropriate answer, which you think, according to you, what does this phrase mean? Uh, here, sorry about that. There we go. So we have given you three options. The coming to an end of mean the period is slowly coming to an end or it's, it's you know, gradually decreasing or coming to an end, the action of ending the period or just the end of period. Take about, you know, 20, 25 seconds to answer this. Well, the answers are trickling in very fast. And I'm glad to see that most of you are making a right decision. All right. So, all right. Last five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one zero okay i am ending this poll over here and let me broadcast the results beautiful beautiful seriously 71 percent of the class has no doubt that the term the coming to an end of means the period is gradually coming to an end right if i were to describe it to you in you know through an example um, in a picture representation form, this is how I would put it. You know, 
we have a time period from point A to point D. So by the period, uh, by this term, the coming to an end, what we are saying is that, okay, during period A, there were so many woolly mammoths. Period B, the number started to decline. By C, they even declined further. And by the time period D came, they were all gone. So, you know, from point A to point D, we have that sense of gradual decline in the number of woolly mammoths. So what we would say that by the time, you know, by the period uh, or the woolly mammoths, they, they, they became it's extinct by the coming to the end of the ice age. This is what we are trying to, this is what the sentence is also trying to say, that there was a growth, there was a period of rapid growth uh, or productivity in agricultural produce, and that period started coming to an end. So it's not that, that the deterioration happened overnight. No, it started at one point in time and slowly, 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 you know, over a period of time, over a stretch of time, it started dwindling, dwindling, dwindling. And then a time came when that period was over completely. This is exactly what we are trying to show here through this example also. That's the meaning of the phrase, the coming to an end. Also, in our um, other choices, um, by ending, you know, here we say by ending. This is what we see in choice D, right? Um, the uh, 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 less by government regulation than by ending the ice age. Now, this particular phrase actually, you know, denotes an action of ending the period, as if somebody ended the ice age or somebody ended the period of that agricultural growth, and that is not logical because. Really, this is something, it's, an, it's, a, it's a natural phenomenon or a natural event that took place. Nobody really, you know, willfully brought a particular period to an end. That's the meaning that we get by the, uh, you know, by ending uh, the, the period. Now the last one, which is our choice E, by the end of the period. When we are saying that the woolly mammoth became extinct by the end of the ice age, we are only talking about point D in the ice age. We are not talking about from points A to point C, nothing. We, just, we are just saying that by the end of the ice age, which is point number D, there were no woolly mammoths by the end of this period does not give us that sense or does not give us that meaning of a period slowly, slowly, slowly getting over, over a stretch of time. Okay. So this is, this is decoding that small little part of the whole sentence that was underlined in our official sentence. All right. I have already shown to you the uh, meaning of this particular uh, phrase, right? Now, I want to give you another chance to answer this question now that you have understood all about the coming to an end. So if I were to show the question to you, okay, let me go back probably. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Should have put a... Hmm. Okay, if I show you the question here, what will be your answer now? Let's take another shot at this question. Now that you completely understand the meaning of that underlined portion in the sentence, what would be your choice? Well, the answers are coming in fast. All right. So let me broadcast the results here. 81% of you or 80, it's going on. It's increasing. That number is still increasing. 
87, let's see. Okay, 86, 80, 87, 88. Okay, well, my whole point is here and let me end this poll here. So if I start the poll here, it's a clean sweep, you know, choice C, a clean sweep here. That's what we see. And this is the magic. I literally call it magic. This is the magic of understanding the meaning of what we are reading. Once we understand the meaning, it becomes so smooth to select the correct expression to express that meaning. Because we all are logical people. We know how to express. We can decode a written piece of literature. You know, we can we can all read and make sense of things that we read and we speak. So it is not difficult at all for us to spend this time in understanding the meaning of the sentence. Once again, I always say this, that every single essay problem is a story by itself. It's a complete story. Everything that you require to solve a question correctly Every bit of information is right there in that sentence. All you need to do is that, you know, spend that time with the original sentence and extract all the logical pieces of information that the author is trying to present. And you'll see that, you know, your answer choice, answer choice analysis will be a cakewalk. Okay. It will be a cakewalk. Um, okay. So, Choice C indeed is the correct answer over here. Let me explain. I think now you probably understand why the other answer choice, other choice, um, answer choices are incorrect. I'm getting little tongue twisted here. Okay, so choice B is of course choices A and B are wrong for the missing by that is no brainer at all choice c is definitely the correct answer that we have already seen we have established also why choice d is incorrect because by ending a period of rapid growth gives us the gives us the meaning that somebody ended that period and that definitely is not a logical uh, the logical meaning in the context of this sentence and then we know that choice here then we understand that choice e is also not the correct answer although it looks very neat it sounds absolutely right but looking and sounding are not the uh, they are not the criteria for choosing an answer choice the answer choice must convey logical meaning through the correct grammatical structure. That's what we are looking for. So choice C is the answer that that is correct. You'll be surprised to know that, you know, OG Advanced actually um, categorizes this uh, sentence as a grammar based question because they really think that, hey, you, you won't understand the coming to an end of, you know, it should give you that sense, which all of you did. You know, when I took that poll in which I asked you, how did you understand this underlined portion in the sentence? 71% of you did, did tell me the right meaning. You know, and that's all you had to stick to just by inserting that by which choice C does. And that's why OG Advance classifies this as, an, as a grammar based question. That's all you need to do. Just, you know, plug in a by after then and get going. But, you know, such a beautiful question to understand the importance of understanding the meaning of the sentence. So always make sure that when you are when when you are served an essay question, you don't look at the answer choices. You first pay attention to the meaning of the sentence. And I have a question in 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 the chat box. I'm uh, sorry, in our Q and A pod, and I think it's pretty relevant to take this up at this point in time in our discussion. Shantanu is asking, can you please tell how to decipher the sentence like you just did without rewriting the sentence in the breakdown form as it consumes more? 
time. Anything that you will do for the first time will take time. Why? Because you're consciously performing each and every method. And that's why in the beginning of the, sen uh, uh, be beginning of the session, if you remember, I told you that you need to internalize the process. We never say that you're going to learn this process overnight. No, think about anything that you have learned, any skill that you have tried to acquire in your life, be it walking, you know, the all of us, we not that we were born walking, right? But yes, it, it requires time to master to master any skill. Think about driving a car, playing any sport, um, you know, riding your bike, anything, learning a new language for that matter, you know, picking up any hobby and becoming good at it. Anything that you pick up to learn. If you want to become good at it, you'll have to keep practicing, 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 follow the process till the process becomes internalized. So Shantanu, the answer to your question is that you'll have to first get into the habit of practicing um, solving sentence correction questions in this way, breaking them down, write them down, and then learn the method as to how to decipher the meaning. Uh, you know about it will take you about 15 to 18 to 20 questions to practice nicely and then the whole thing will be you will be able to internalize the process and then by the and that's why i say you know your prep time is your investment time at this point in time you have all the luxury of time in the world so utilize it correctly to learn these skills you can you can put in that extra time to learn these skills so that you reap the benefits on your D-Day, you know, on the day when you're writing the exam, because by that time you would be so good at the process. The process would have become so nicely internalized by you that the moment you see an SC question, your brain, you know, developing muscle memory, that is what we call muscle memory. Once you develop the muscle memory to solve SC questions, you will not have to write anything on a paper, on a piece of paper. OK, so with this, um, we understood that uh, it is very, very crucial to understand the meaning of the sentence. Do not look at the answer choices first, because again, it's important to understand the entire story to be able to decode what those little fragments uh, from the story are telling you. So you first pay attention to the full, full story and not to the trailer. <laughs> OK, so understand the story and then pick up which answer choice best fits the context of the sentence in terms of logic and grammar, of course. OK, moving on to uh, our observations about this question. As I already told you, this is from OG Advanced. About 25% of the sentence was underlined, very small little phrase, which did the trick already. And uh, splits method, how did it work out? We could only reject two answer choices, but did it did it help us get to the correct answer choice? No, it did not. So for difficult questions where logic is really, really important, which we feel at EGMAT is for every single sentence, it, it stands true for every single sentence, we need to, uh, we need an approach that will, um, you know, that will just, uh, that will make sure that every time we apply the process, we get to the correct answer. That's what we need to learn. So for this question, we definitely, even if a very small portion of the sentence was underlined without meaning, we could not solve it correctly. But the moment we understood the meaning of that little portion, you know, C, everybody landed on C, 91%. I, I <laughs> closed the poll. I would have gotten more answers over there. All right. So with this, let's move on to our next question. And let's repeat the ritual of clicking, clicking on still solving. You will only see question number two once. I have gotten a good amount of uh, votes for still solving. I have 156 participants right now. Show me a little more enthusiasm. Show me a little love. <laughs> All right. Can we push that number to 90? I'm at 88. 
request two of you to do so. Just one, 89, good job. Let's show you question number two. Another question from official guide, rated 700 level. So all the best. Again, guys, think about the logic, okay? All right, so I see more than 80% of the class is done solving this question. Sorry about that question. Um, let's make a selection here. 
and let's you know take care of this question i really like this question um and uh, just to mention my colleague stacy she's not here with me today generally uh, she and I, we do this, do this session together and she takes care of the first two questions. And she would tell you that she actually bought heirloom tomatoes. She tried them and she did uh, say that, yes, they look bad. They really look bad, but they are very, very amazing to eat. And um, yeah, so you should try that. And um, yes, I'm missing Stacey, but uh, she's going to be back very soon. All right. So let's move on and let's solve this question um but before that a five second countdown for those who've still not made a decision i would just say that you know choose an answer choice and let's get going five four three two one and zero so i'm ending the poll right over here all right now let's see what's going on with this sentence and then again meaning-based approach and the best way to understand the meaning is to break the sentence into smaller chunks because this sentence again is pretty context heavy the structure is rather more complex than the last sentence we read if we read everything in one go, trust me, we will make mistakes. And even when we straighten this sentence out, there will still be some room for confusion. And I'll prove that to you as we discuss. So hold on to all your questions and please pay attention to the analysis because I believe that by the end of the analysis, you would you would get the clear picture as to what's going on in this sentence okay so let's just do that although my very first word is a contrast presenting expression so i know that we are going to read a contrast in this sentence and i have a lot of questions for you in this uh, sentence because we are going to solve it together so on your screen, you can see a um, short answer poll. So wait for my question. When I ask you the question and I reopen the poll, that's when you're going to answer this question, uh, answer my questions, okay? So although appearing less appetizing than most of their round and red supermarket cousins. Okay, so we understand the author is talking about some entity that does not look very pretty again the comparison is here than most of their round and red supermarket cousins so the supermarket cousins are round and red and uh, but the cousin of the red uh, round and red supermarket or whatever you know they both would be both the entities would be cousins to each other right so this particular entity that the author is talking about definitely does not look as pretty as its round and red supermarket cousins. What is that entity? Now we get to read about that entity, which is heirloom tomatoes. So the author is talking about heirloom tomatoes that do not look very pretty and what is the comparison? The supermarket cousins are prettier because they are red and round, right? So they are red, they're round. We all have experience with tomatoes. Let's just visualize the sentence a little bit. That will help us in understanding the meaning of the sentence. And we should often use this tool to get to, you know, understand the meaning a little more in a much better way right so we we know tomatoes you know whenever we go out shopping tomatoes we look for nice red smooth you know tomatoes so that's the supermarket cousins but the heirloom tomatoes do not look that pretty that's what the author is telling us then the author presents some extra information about heirloom tomatoes what are these tomatoes they are grown or grown from seeds saved during the previous year 
Okay, so these heirloom tomatoes are grown from seeds that were saved during the previous years. Now, I'm going to just read this bit of information and I'm going to ask you a question. They are often green and striped or have plenty of bumps and bruises. Tell me, which entity is this part of sentence talking about? Who are often green and striped or have plenty of bumps and bruises? You can call it HT. No need to write all that big words. Learn to abbreviate. That will also help you in saving time. So HT, correct. It is the heirloom tomatoes that are green and striped and have plenty of bumps and bruises. Now, let me ask you another question. I'm clearing the poll out here. Listen to my question carefully and then give me the answer. Okay. Which piece of information can we connect this description to? You know, they are often green and striped or have plenty of bumps and bruises. Whatever we have read so far, to which part of the sentence can we connect this information with? You know, I'm, I'm trying to play that join the dots kind of a game. We've all done that before. Less appetizing. Appear less appetizing. Absolutely correct. Those of you who've, who are saying it is appear less appetizing, full, full points to you because that is because this part of the sentence is actually talking about the appearance of heirloom tomatoes. See, the author has taken all the effort to describe to us that, yes, they look less appetizing. The author has just not left it for our speculation that if the round and red, if the supermarket cousins are round and red, how would heirloom tomatoes would look? Because author is saying that they look less pretty, right? So if they look less pretty, the author is giving us that information. Yes, they look less pretty because imagine, think of a, think of, Think of a tomato that is green and striped and, and has bumps and bruises on its skin. That's not how we, we buy tomatoes generally. We look for round and red tomatoes, right? So this piece is actually giving us more information about heirloom tomatoes. And mind you, the supermarket cousins have already been described as round and red. Do not later on ask this question that, hey, this day is talking about supermarket cousins and not heirloom tomatoes. No, again, connect that logical dot. And that's why I'm asking this question to you that the author is saying that heirloom tomatoes are less appetizing and this less appetizing appearance has been described uh, through this piece of information that appears between these two long dashes. It is all about heirloom tomatoes. About supermarket cousins, the authors say that they are round and red. Very, very important piece of information to understand and retain also because this will help us in our answer choice analysis. Okay, the last bit of the sentence says, heirlooms are more flavorful and thus in increasing demand. Now, if I were to ask you, okay, let me move on to my next slide where we have all these questions for you. So I have a few questions for you. Let's now answer these questions. What appears less appetizing than most of their round and red supermarket cousins? HT, of course, we do understand that bit. Okay, let me clear all answers here and shoot another question at you. What are grown from seeds saved during the previous year? HT, yes, of course, no doubts about that. Next question. I want you to answer this correctly because we just had a huge discussion about it. What are often green and striped and have bumps and bruises? Absolutely HT. No two ways about it because that's how the author is proving it to us 
that they look less appetizing than their red and brown supermarket cousins. Last question, what are more flavorful and hence in increasing demand? Most definitely HT, all right? That's what the sentence is saying. Now, here I want you to focus on one more logical aspect of the sentence. You know, when we started off talking about this sentence, we said that I see a contrast presenting information, right? Here, if I go to my next slide, you see that I have, you know, identified these various pieces of information about heirloom tomato as A1, A2, A3, and A4. I want you to tell me which two points have been contrasted in the sentence? Which two points have been contrasted in this sentence? A1 and A4. Okay. Two, two points. You'll have to mention two points. One and four. Okay. One and three. Nope. That's not right. Think about it. What is the author saying? Although appearing less appetizing, heirloom tomatoes are more flavorful. So the author is telling us that, hey, heirloom tomatoes may not look very pretty, but they are definitely more flavorful. And that's the intended contrast in the sentence. So that is our points number a1 and a4 they don't look good but they taste amazing that's the logical contrast that this sentence has and all of us can answer this if we only pay attention to the information that's coming and analyze it a little bit that yeah i mean this contrast does make sense right that they may not be they may not be good looking but they taste good but you know when we go to buy tomatoes in the market we we pay more attention to you know red and round uh really to the looks and not do not think so much about the taste because that's what we think that prettier they look better they would taste but that's not the case with heirloom tomato and this is how we arrive at the logical meaning of the sentence so the meaning is very, very clear. The sentence is talking about heirloom tomatoes. It has been compared with its red and round supermarket cousins. By presenting the comparison, the author is saying that heirloom tomatoes may not look as pretty as their round and red supermarket cousins, but most definitely they are more flavorful. And that is the reason why they are in increasing demand. So many people want uh, heirloom tomatoes now. And then in a small, you know, some extra information about heirloom tomatoes that they are grown from seeds, which have been which was which have been saved during the previous year. And also we understand that heirloom tomatoes look, they are often green, they are uh, bruised, and they, ha uh, they have bruises and bumps on their uh, body. So that's why um, the author says that they do not look that pretty. Now that the meaning analysis is over here, um, do you see any grammatical errors that is present in the original sentence? If you are saying yes, could you please tell me what is that? Say yes and then explain it also. Missing a verb, okay? Although appearing, I don't understand what's the problem with although appearing. Subject verb, okay? Um, they missing, uh, appears, HD doesn't have verb, correct. That's exactly, I mean, again, when we do the sentence structure like this, see, it becomes so very easy to figure out that, hey, I can see this blue subject sitting over here. Um, I see a blue subject sitting over here and it has its, you know, again, what Stacy calls them, uh, the subject verb it. She, she says that they are dancing partners, you know. So for this subject, we have the dancing partner here. For this subject, we have two dancing partners here. But for our heirloom tomatoes, the subject, there is no verb in this sentence. So this is another um, um, positive of 
breaking the sentence down into smaller pieces because then we are also able to we are not only able to understand the meaning of the sentence but we are also able to see we we kind of zoom in into the grammar of the sentence also and so finding out these kind of errors like missing verb and you know how the list is looking and other things become very very prominent especially subject verb pairs you know they become really prominent when we break the sentence down into pieces so yes choice a um basically we the original sentence is missing a verb um so this subject heirloom tomatoes does not have a verb and that's the problem with choice a we see the same error being repeated with choice uh c choice e also repeats the same error interestingly uh choice d does not have the grammatical error but it has the meaning error why because there is no contrast anymore in the sentence and why should we take away this contrast this contrast is very very logical in the context of the sentence the author does want to say that hey heirloom tomatoes look uh, ugly but they taste amazing all right so do not judge them by their looks right that's the intended meaning that they may look ugly but they are really really flavorful and that's the reason why they are in increasing demand that means people are liking it for its flavor no matter even if it looks bad so that contrast is very logical in the context of this sentence and we need to keep that contrast in the correct answer choice and that's why choice d loses out because that meaning has been altered by not presenting the intended logical contrast in the sentence right so choice b indeed is the correct answer you guys did pretty well 47% of the class did land up on choice b but i hope after this analysis if you missed out on any logical part of the sentence it should be now very very clear to you so all i'm you know by all these di discussions i'm actually trying to um align you more with the meaning based approach that you're focusing more and more in terms of extracting the meaning of the sentence rather than focusing on the grammar see we do need grammar we are not saying that totally forget grammar no uh, subject has to have a verb that's a grammatical rule but if we understand but if we first understand the meaning picking up these uh, grammatical errors will become even more easier because c choice d does not have any grammatical error as such but it still is wrong and c after b many of you put your faith on choice d but that's not the correct answer why because it has altered the meaning of the sentence by taking away that intended logical contrast you see so that's why it's very very important that we understand the logic of the sentence all right now uh with this let's do a little bit of takeaway from this sentence um extract all the as aspects of meaning what are the aspects as i told earlier they are those logical pieces of information that uh that is presented by the author okay and uh, we need to extract them it's like again you know logical dots remember i i mentioned to you that when we were young we used to get those number with with dots and we would connect those numbers one after the other and by the time we would come to the to the last number we would have we would get a very nice picture that we drew without any drawing skills just by um connecting the dots right in the same way in sc also we connect the logical dots um in order to understand the meaning of the sentence and so once we do that you know it becomes really easy to take care of all those answer choices that do not align with the intended logic of the sentence so that's what we need to do extract aspects the logical pieces of information from the sentence a little observation here of course this sentence had a longer portion underlined compared to the first question um 
again here splits was not possible because uh, the answer choices were differently worded so of course that's not the method that we can fall back on um, but once we understood the meaning of the sentence it was so very easy for us to see that choice d did not stand the chance to be the correct answer because it did not present the intended meaning right so only on on the basis of that information we could reject choice d and we could select choice b so with this we have come to the end of two questions and now we have two more questions to go in this um session now at this point in time you may ask a question that hey um you know is it is it always so that the sentence will present logical meaning uh because the first two sentences that we solved the meaning was pretty clear you know whenever we broke the sentence down and we did the meaning analysis analysis the meaning appeared to be very logical and we understood that we just had to fix the grammar of that sentence in order to get the correct version of the sentence but is it is it always going to be so that my original sentence will present uh, the logical meaning the answer to that question is no but do you have any reasons to be scared the answer is no we don't why because remember i told you in the beginning again that every single sc sentence is a complete story by itself and whatever you whatever piece of information you need to solve that question correctly or to understand the intended logic of that sentence it will all be there present in the sentence only you know we all are logical people we have a uh, a logical bent of mind and we do understand you know how to how, that 2 plus 2 make 4 right so when we when we read a sentence that will present very illogical meaning you will be able to see that for yourself you will be able to identify that hey wait something is not uh falling in line over here it, it it is just not logical and but the sentence will have enough information for you to be able to piece the logic together and understand what the author is trying to say so author may not always present the logical meaning through the original sentence and this is what we are going to see with our next two questions where the original sentence will not be logical so it is now your duty to spend a little bit of more effort and time with the original sentence to now first infer or deduce the logical meaning and then move on to your error analysis or whatever till now what we did we looked at the sentence we broke it down into pieces we read it we understood the meaning we didn't have to do much about the meaning because the meaning was pretty uh logical but with these two sentences you'll have to take that extra step of now inferring the logical meaning also so with that disclaimer <laughs> let me present to you the poll for our next question and all of you know the drill by now we are going to so uh, click on still solving let's get that number up please let's let's click quickly on still solving because that's how i know how many of you are participating in this question and again you are setting the pace for your class not me not timer no watch nothing okay so let's just get little more little more five more three more three more people click on still solving please can we get that number to a good 85 two more one more very good here comes your question number 3 again logical approach ask yourself is it logical okay all the best
All right, let's wind this up. Most of you are done here. Let's take five more seconds and finish this one off. In the sense that let's just <laughs> make a dis decision and move on. Didn't mean to sound violent, I'm sorry about that. Okay, last three seconds. Three, two, one, zero. All right, I'm closing the poll here. Any last minute takers? You want to click on any answer choice and move on then? No? Yes? Okay, there I end the poll. You know, before I begin, this is one of my favorite questions in OG, especially in OG Advanced. This is such a beautiful question. And you can see that you can actually, you really need so little grammar to solve this question. It is totally, um, you know, meaning ba based question. And, you know, from your answers, I could see that you did understand the intended logic of the sentence, even if this sentence did not present logical meaning. And trust me, this time I'm not going to do the, the meaning analysis for you. I'm going to take your help in doing so. Okay. So, what is the sentence saying? Many of them chiseled from solid rock centuries ago. How many of you, you know, when you read the word chiseled, uh, could you understand the meaning or could you relate it to something or that word helped you in understanding the meaning of the sentence? How many of you would say that, yes, the word chiseled helped me really understand what was going on in the sentence? Could you visualize? You see, so many of you. You know, for me, when I read this sentence, and again, I'm I'm telling this, this again, bringing forth the importance of visualizing in, information and that in wood context, okay, yeah, caves, absolutely. You know, when I read that word first time, chiseled, you know, it reminded me of the tool chisel, which is generally used you know, generally, again, I'm I'm not a sculptor. I don't belong to that background. Um, you know, but again, from you know whatever caves that we have, so many famous caves in India and around the world also. But you know, we understand that you know generally sculptors or maybe carpenters also they use chisel and hammer together to chisel something. You know, what is that process exactly? I don't know. I don't know, but I know that it's a tool. Chisel is a tool. So the moment I read that word, most many of them chiseled from solid rock centuries ago, I knew that the sentence is talking about something man-made. Do you agree with this, this, uh, this assessment of mine? That the moment I read the word chiseled, many of them are chiseled. We are talking about something man-made. See, I like that. Yes, thank you. All right, now let's move on. What the sentence is saying, the mountainous regions of northern Ethiopia are dotted or they contain, uh, they are dotted with hundreds of monasteries, okay? So the author is talking actually about this mountainous regions in northern Ethiopia and these particular mountains, mountainous regions have lot of or have hundreds of monasteries there. This is the meaning of the sentence. Now, my next question to you is, the way the sentence is written the way the sentence is written, does it present logical meaning? Does it present logical meaning? No, it doesn't. Why do you say no? Why no? Why? What is the sentence saying? What is, what is that illogical piece of information here? Makes it sound like the mountains are chiseled. Modifier error. What are chiseled? Okay, uh, no, it says mountains are chiseled. Makes, okay, um, chiseled is being meant for mountains. The two sentences seem disconnected. Okay, that's not what I'm asking. At this structure, it is as if chiseled are the mountains. Yes, meaning 
uh, the, uh, the way the sentence is written, we can understand that what is being chilled are actually the mountainous regions. Frankly speaking, I don't remember reading about any mountainous regions anywhere ever, not even in my geography books when I was growing up, that there has been a mountainous or there have been mountainous regions that have been chiseled or that have been made by human beings. So see, the logical error is so, so very obvious in the sentence that even if our friend, the author, mangled the logic of this sentence completely by not putting the pieces of information in the right order as they should appear, we still could figure out that, hey, nobody can chisel mountainous regions. That's, that's not possible at all. So what should it be in the sentence? What is that entity in the sentence that can be chiseled? What is that entity in the sentence that can be chiseled? That's my question to you. Monasteries. Absolutely correct. Because those are the man-made uh, objects. And yes, if they are built in the mountainous regions and built out of rock, then it makes all the sense that those people who made those monasteries over there must have chiseled them from the solid rock. So that is what I'm looking for in this sentence. So even if the sentence is not logical, the information in the sentence, they are enough contextually to make me understand that, hey, what are chiseled are the monasteries and not the mountainous regions. Well done. Very good. Very good. Now, I have one last question before we move on to our other steps in the sentence. This is my first piece of information, right? And this is my second piece of information. So this is, you know, take a look at it as a puzzle piece. This is my piece number one, and this is my piece number two. Right now, I have one and two, but the meaning is absolutely mangled, absolutely logical. I change the order, okay? What I'm going to do is that I'm going to lift this piece number one and place it after two. So now the order of the pieces in which I'm laying it down is two and one. So if I do that, if I lift this piece of information and po uh, post it right after monasteries, the very same piece of information, will my sentence become correct? What do you think? Will my sentence become correct? Here I see a little lack in confidence. Despite you all knowing will sound more logical, will, will only sound logical. That's the only way to make, make it them issue. Okay, let's not talk about grammar. I'm only talking from the meaning perspective. Okay, logically, yes, exactly. Because now what we are saying is that, you know, uh, many of them chiseled is supposed to talk about hundreds of monasteries. So let's place it closer to hundreds of monasteries. Then only it will make logical sense, right? That's, that's from the logical perspective. And so, you know, again, um, trying to understand the beauty of the logical based approach, the logic based approach, the meaning based approach. What is that beauty? That beauty is that when we understand the meaning of such sentences in such clarity on the basis of logic, I can also preempt that, okay, my correct answer choice may even look like that. Now, again, don't take me out of context. I'm not trying to say that with every single sentence, you will be able to preempt the correct answer choice. No, but frankly, with this sentence, when I had this, you know, um, puzzle jigsaw puzzle approach with this sentence, that, okay, I have two pieces of puzzle over here. Right now it is one and two, but with one and two, I'm not getting the correct logical picture. But if I make it two and one, will the logic 
uh, fall in place? Yes, it will. So all I need to do is that I need to pick up that opening piece of information and place it after hundreds of monasteries to fix the logical error in the sentence. Okay, that's one of the ways of correcting the answer choice. And that's what I preempted that, okay, that's, that's what I need. I need to see many of them chiseled next to hundreds of monasteries. That's my way to evaluate the sentence. With this understanding, now let's move on to all these we have already covered. We've already spoken about the aspects. Aspect two is definitely illogical. And when we questioned ourselves, we figured out that it is logically it is the monasteries that should be chiseled. The monasteries were chiseled, right? We've already come to this point. And now it's time, for, now that we understand the logic of the sentence so well, it's time to take a look at the answer choices because grammatically, really, grammatically, there is nothing wrong in the sentence. It's just the placement of that opening piece of information that is absolutely at the wrong place that totally mangles the meaning of the sentence. For your information, another OG advanced question, as I said, um, it's one of my favorite OG advanced questions, totally meaning based. And of course, we can see what's going on with this sentence. Okay, now let me broadcast the result over here. At this point in time, I request all of you to hold your questions about D and E. I know most of you have this question about how to make a decision between D and E because from, from your poll results also, you can see that there is a clear tug of war between these two answer choices. I'll tell you which is the correct answer and why it is the correct answer choice and what is that um, you know, deciding factor that actually brings us to the correct answer choice. Okay, so hold on to all your questions. I have, I will cover all of them provided you listen and do not ask questions. Okay. I mean, ask questions when I'm done, but yeah, I think that, you know, the analysis will cover it all. Okay, choice B. Choice B continues to present that illogical aspect. We are still getting this meaning that it is the mountainous regions that are covered by, uh, sorry, that were chiseled from solid rock centuries ago. So that's our logical error. The sentence also has a grammatical error of redundancy. Hundreds of monasteries already means numerous. We don't need to add many uh, before this expression. So that's a redundancy error that we have in choice B. Now, choice C, for the first time, corrects the logic of the sentence, right? Hundreds of monasteries, many of them chiseled from solid rock centuries ago. This is what we require. We understand that this particular piece of information is the description for hundreds of monasteries. And so... Um, it has been placed next to it. So my logical error has been taken care of in choice C, but it has a grammatical error, R dotting. When we say R dotting, it is a present continuous tense. What is the meaning basically that we are getting that the monasteries are coming up as you and I are part of you know, as I am talking to you in this session right now. Right now, the monasteries are coming up on these mountainous regions. And so the meaning presented by the use of this particular verb is absolutely nonsensical. So choice C is out. All right, time for the climax. Choice D has gotten the maximum number of votes, which is 45%. But I'm sorry to break your hearts. Choice D is not the correct answer. What did you miss here? What you missed here is the grammar, um, or let's say the meaning, uh, uh, with the, uh, the meaning that we are getting with the use of are chiseled. Look at the sentence. The mountainous regions of Northern Utopia are dotted with hundreds of monasteries, many of which are chiseled from solid rock centuries ago. 
will you ever use a simple present tense verb for an action that took place hundreds of years ago please take to the yes or no poll and let me know of your answer will you use a simple past simple present tense verb for an action that took place centuries ago definitely not definitely not it just does not gel together right so choice d is wrong now trust me many of which that usage is absolutely fine in choice d so your next question could be that if we change r into were will choice d become correct yes it will become correct because this is the only error that we are dealing with in this sentence so this expression many of which is correct many of which is talking about hundreds of monasteries no issues with that it's only our verb tense that totally falls apart you know that totally uh, you know it, it just makes the sentence so incorrect and so choice e is the correct answer now look at the structure of this sentence this is your original sentence right many of them chisel from rocks uh, solid rock centuries ago the same absolutely the same piece of information appears right at the end of the sentence next to hundreds of monasteries so this is the same thing you know puzzle piece number 2 and then comes puzzle piece number 1 and the 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 grammar is sorted the logic is sorted everything is sorted in this sentence regarding uh, this one okay so now here you you can ask okay many of you will say but you know how them is not ambiguous this and that see just just ask yourself this question that when many of them chiseled was placed next to the mountainous regions then we had no no doubts about it then we knew that many of them is talking about the mountain mountainous regions so now if many of them has been placed next to hundreds of monasteries why should we have this question in our head that it is ambiguous no it is not ambiguous it is placed closer to this noun so many of them will talk about hundreds of monasteries that's how the the sentence is flowing that's how we are reading the sentence and that's how we are getting the meaning that's how we are connecting the logical dots so no issues with many of them chiseled from solid rocks in this sentence now let's come to the discussion of choice d and choice e i have already explained to you in terms of structure with the usage of many of which versus many of them they both are correct in choice d we have a we have an independent clause and then the describe uh, the descriptor for hundreds of monasteries appear in form of a clause because you know we have this particular word over here that calls for the usage of a subject verb pe but this particular uh, entity is also talking about hundreds of monasteries and in this one we have an independent clause which ends in a noun and then many of them is describing hundreds of monasteries no issues with the structure of the sentence at all the only problem with choice d is the use of this wrong verb tense r if we turn it into ver then choice d would become correct but we don't want to do that because there is only one correct answer for every single question now that i have discussed everything about this particular question let me ask you this now are you 100% sure of what's going on in this question everything is clear you should not have any more questions about many of which and many of them because you know again i have explained it to you okay no questions of preference this could be another question that okay if we have both first of all you will not see many of which were chiseled and many of them chiseled 
together in the same uh, question because they both are correct. They both are equally correct in terms of logic and in terms of grammar. So make it a point uh, that or note it down in a piece of paper or wherever you want to is that there will never be two correct answer choices in the same SC problem or for that matter in any subsection of GMAT. There will never be two correct answer choices. When the two structures are logically and grammatically correct, there is no question of preference. So you will get only one of them in your question and the, and the choice will be absolutely straightforward. You are going for that. There is only one and one correct answer choice logically and grammatically and that's what you need to choose. So there is no question of preference between between two correct answer choices or two correct uh, correct expressions or correct versions of sentences. Okay. Um, all right. How be confident that you have chosen the right answer? So Suhani, again, it's the matter of practice. If you, you will know, uh, you know, once you have internalized the process, you yourself will feel that you've, you've gotten the logic right and you've gotten the the uh, the meaning of the sentence right so you will have enough practice to tell you that yes my selection is right you know we are not playing a guessing game here again internalizing the meaning based approach is not still lying in that guessing zone where you are not sure whether you've gotten a question right or not. The whole idea of internalizing and accepting the meaning-based approach is to be sure that, yes, this is the approach that works on every single question. And if I use this approach, I'm going to get this question right. So, yeah, you will actually come. I mean, internalizing this process will actually, uh, you know, uh, take you out from that zone of uh, am, am I right? Am I wrong? That guessing zone, you will be completely out of it. Okay. Chiseled is acting as a verb. No, chiseled is acting as a verb ED modifier. It is acting. Ask yourself, the monastery is chiseled anything? Did the monastery do the job of chiseling anything? No. So chiseled is not a verb. Right. It is a it is a modifier. Exactly the same thing that we saw in choice A. If you did not have that question about chiseled in choice A, you should not have this question about chiseled in choice E also because the structure is absolutely the same. So, you know, do not complicate things when they are not complicated. You know, that's the basic rule of, of doing anything right. That do not overcomplicate things when they are actually simple. Okay? So Mayank, you're asking if R removed from D, will it be correct? No, we need a verb there. We need R chiseled or were chiseled. Okay, we, that's what we need. Yeah, Shantanu, you can call it a noun plus noun modifier. But again, the idea of this session is not to give you grammatical jargon. Just understand from the meaning perspective. Okay, understand from the meaning perspective. Again, don't ask those grammatical questions that are not even relevant to your understanding of the logic of the sentence. Again, that's a request. Do not complicate things when they are not complicated. You know, you don't have to worry about active, passive, this, that. You get your meaning through the meaning approach. You're getting to the right answer. And this is exactly how the logic is working in this sentence. Okay. All right, so with this, let's move on to our last question. But before that, a little bit of uh, lowdown or a little bit of um, takeaway uh, about this question. 100% clarity um, about the meaning of the sentence is important. Again, as I said, we all are logical people and we understand uh, that the logic works in a certain way. And if a sentence, if the original sentence is that illogical, we will be able to locate that bizarre meaning from the sentence. And that's why when 
when we see that our original sentence is not giving out logical meaning, we will have to take that extra step to extract the logical meaning from the sentence. Okay. All right. With this, let's move on to our, okay, observations, 100% uh, underlined sentence, uh, as we saw. Again, splits was not possible because, you know, the structure of every answer choice was different. We could actually solve this question within 90 seconds. Actually, we can solve this question within 90 seconds if we have that logical clarity about the sentence. Seriously, I'm, I'm not saying it just for the heck of it, but that's, that is what... Um, you know, the meaning based approach empowers us to do. Right. So, yeah. Now, um, asking a question here, um, you all solve official questions. You all, you know, let's talk about official questions and GMAT prep questions, because that's what we always ask students to stick to when it comes to practice and learning SC. You know, what is the source of our solution? Now, I'm not actively looking for an answer, but, you know, I kind of let me predict the answer for you. Most of you would say that, okay, um, either we look at the OG solutions, which are there in the OG book itself, or we go to GNAT Club. And yes, that's a very obvious place to look for explanations on official questions because, you know, there are so many experts out there and they all bring in some uh, some piece of information which 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 is useful for us. So yeah, a lot of discussions happen at GMAT Club. So we look for solutions at uh, GMAT Club, which is fine. The whole idea about asking this question to you is that, um, um, you know, the way we provide solutions to the question with the kind of details and it is you know, it's not that our solutions are different from what I'm dealing with today here or how I'm explaining each and every answer choice to you or the question to you here. But every single question I either we created or is it an official question, our approach to all our solution is this detailed and you will not find any incongruity or any discrepancy in um in descriptions or uh, you know in in the explanation of different kind of uh, uh concepts um that is that that we teach in our concept and that we bring or test in our questions you know i have seen that discrepancy a lot in many of the og solutions you know at some places they are saying that this particular uh, expression is wrong the very same expression in, an, in another question, they say that is right. And I've heard so many students talk about it and bring those solutions to our attention that, hey, you know, I, I really don't know how to reconcile with, with these two uh, diametrically opposite uh, explanation for the same uh, expression. And, and that's why we say that at EGMAT, there is no incongruency or, or there is no discrepancy between our, uh, among our um, explanations that we provide for the solution. So yeah, just a little information, right? So, and this is, this is the way, and if you do not have those detailed solutions and analysis, really, because we, we also propagate the idea of strategic reviewing, you know, official questions are just not meant for attempting going and checking for the answer key, see whether you got it right or wrong and then move on. No. Even if you get, I mean, forget about if you get it wrong, you'll have to do strategic review. But even if you, we, that's what we tell our students, that even if you've gotten a question right, you must do strategic review. That is to look at the detailed solution in order to be sure that you've chosen the right answer for the right reason. There is no luck factor there. There is no guessing work happening in any of the sentence. That's the confidence that you get when you apply meaning-based approach. So one of our students asked us that question, right? That how am I supposed to be sure if I've chosen the right answer or not? You will see this. You will see your accuracy going up when you continuously apply the meaning-based approach to solve every SC question. And 
and that learning is facilitated by strategic review of every question that you solve, be it OG or our own questions. So with that, let's now come to the very last question of this, um, of this session. Same drill, let's click on still solving. And while you are clicking on still solving, I'll give you a little disclaimer here. This question is probably the most difficult question in this session. I'm talking about in this session, which actually requires you to really take a, you know, a proper dip into, I mean, you'll really have to go deeper into the sentence in order to figure out the logic because this sentence actually is pretty context heavy and you'll have to really break break down the sentence in order to understand the meaning. Again, I'm not trying to scare you here, but all I'm saying is that, that even when the sentence becomes this uh, context heavy, the meaning-based approach actually helps us sail through it really, really smooth, okay? Okay. Um, I have 54 people who've clicked on still solving. Can I get that number a little bit more? Because I still have 112 strong people in this session with me working it out. All righty, perfect. We've gotten a good number of responses here on still solving. Here comes question number four, deep dive, right? Get into the very you know, base of the sentence. All the best, guys.
All right. Most of you are done working. Uh, uh, I mean, you guys have solved this question. Some of you are still working on it. I would say let's take 10 seconds and finish this one off. We've already spent quite a lot of time in here. You guys are doing good. Still the energy is up. So very nice. And this is the last question. No more questions for you. So <laughs> let's end on a good note with this one. All right. 10 seconds. Five seconds. All right, 10 seconds are over. You can just pick any answer and move on. Of course, you know, nobody's going to get points here, but it's just that we will definitely explain everything here. The idea here is to learn, really, uh, not to score the best, right? Okay, so I am ending the poll. Uh, there I go. Now, I have a question for you here. Let me clear out all the responses. And my question to you here is that, um, you know, I am 100% sure of the logic that I have used to, to select the answer choice that I have selected. How many of you would say yes to that? Then I'm 100% sure that the logic I have used to select the answer choice that I have selected is absolutely sound. Are you that confident about your selection? 100% confident? Can you teach this sentence to anyone next time? Are you going to come join me in the session and actually take the microphone and teach it to the fellow students? <laughs> Can you do that for me? All right. OK, so I'm ending the poll here. 64% of you are really confident about your analysis. And that's very good. That's a very good place to begin from. OK, now I'm not going to show you your selection as of now, but I'll definitely need your help in decoding this sentence. So please participate. Um, in this short answer poll question. And it's a short answer poll, not a so short question poll. So please don't ask questions here. And again, I would encourage all of you to give me an audience when I explain this question to you. You can hold on to your question till the end of the analysis. The chances are that you know by the time we are done discussing this question, your doubts would already have been answered, OK? So just just uh, hold on to, to your questions for now. Youth sentence to begin with, I think probably the longest sentence in the uh, session, most definitely. And this is one of the longest sentence in our OG books also. Really, really long, long OK? So it's absolutely imperative. To break this sentence down, we are doing what we call here at EGMAT the strategic pausing, where we break the sentence into smaller chunks. And this is what we this is how we are going to read the sentence. About five million acres in the United States have been invaded by leafy spurge. So even if I don't remember that uh, detail, five million acres, we can at least say that yes. A huge piece of land, a huge piece of land in the United States have been covered by what is called leafy spurge. Now, I really don't know what leafy spurge means, but, you know, by this term leafy over here, I can at least take a guess that probably the author is talking about a plant or a vegetation, right? It's a leafy something something that has got leaves, right? Leafy spurts. That's how I'm decoding uh, the information in my head. However, as always, our writer or author is kind enough to explain such foreign expressions to us because, you know, not all of us are, you know, masters in botany or, you know, plant science or whatever. So the author explains to us, what is leafy spurge? A herbaceous plant 
so herbaceous i think herb it comes from herb maybe it looks like a herb smaller plant maybe whatever does not matter if we don't know the dictionary meaning of it but yes i know that it's a plant from eurasia with milky sap so this leafy spurge contains milky sap and that gives mouth sores to cattle okay so this milky sap gives mouth sores to cattle okay okay so far so good yes of course the milky sap may have some chemical that can give mouth sores to cattle It happens that's fine acceptable things become interesting from this point on okay so here let's take a look at what the sentence is saying we have a comma plus a verb ing modifier so a comma plus verb ing modifier that appears after a clause that gives mouth sores to cattle so you know if you've gone through our free trial trial which we very strongly recommend to to all of those who come to join us in this sc session that you go through um the free trial concepts because there we have some very key concepts that will help you understand these uh usages that especially this one comma plus verb ing modifier it's presenting the result over here so basically this is my cause uh milky sap gives mouth sores to cattle now the result of this action of giving mouth sores to cattle is that it because milky sap gives mouth sores to cattle it displaces grasses and other cattle food so that's my effect number 1 why i'm saying effect number 1 because i see and so i know that there is probably another effect coming up but that's my effect number 1 for now answer this question of mine does this cause and effect make sense that because mouth sap gives a uh, uh, milky sap gives mouth sores to cattle it displaces what is the meaning of displacement how do we displace something it literally means to replace right that one thing takes place of something else right displace right change the place right now how can milky sap displace grasses and other cattle food does that make sense that a liquid removes grasses and cattle food and takes its place does that make sense i don't think that makes sense at all but there is one entity in this sentence that can actually logically displace grasses and other cattle food can you tell me which herbaceous plant or leafy spurge absolutely correct it is ls yes call it ls you don't have to write leafy spurge so it is ls it is the leafy spurge why because it's one kind of a vegetation right and that one kind of a vegetation can you know what what do weeds do if if you have any uh, practical experience in lawn mowing or maintaining a lawn or a, a a front yard or a back yard whatever you call it you will understand this whole concept of weed even if you've done a little bit of uh, you know gardening you will know what do le uh, weeds do Th that's what they do they displace you know whatever is there you know they'll come up they'll take a small space and then they'll start growing up so rapidly that eventually the main plant will die and there will be just weed so that is called displacement displacement so it's one kind of vegetation that moves away the existing vegetation from there that's displacement displacement and displacement can only in in the context of this sentence it is only leafy spurge that can displace grasses and other cattle food because grasses and other cattle food are also type of vegetation although the sentence doesn't say that but we know that from our common sense and from our visualization so going back to my question is this cause and effect uh logical can milky sap result in displacing grasses and other cattle food by giving mouth sores and do not miss that part giving mouth sores what is the effect the cause is 
that the milky sap is giving mouth sores and because it is giving mouth sores it is displacing grasses and classes i mean how how does that even happen i'm not even able to visualize that part so no it doesn't happen it doesn't work that way so i know for sure that my first part over here is not making sense at all okay mm. now my second part what is it saying rendering rangeland worthless okay again this is my effect number two my cause is still the same mind you what is the cause the cause is that milky sap gives mouth sores to cattle and because it gives mouth sores to cattle it makes the rain it makes the rangeland that means the grazing grounds useless now tell me does this again think logically giving mouth sores can giving mouth sores result in making the grazing grounds useless how do grazing of course mouth sores what will happen is that maybe the cattle will not eat food for a few days but then when the when when the cattle is fine it will come back to the grazing grounds again to eat food right so how does milky giving mouth sores milky sap giving mouth sores will lead to making the the grazing grounds useless so this cause and effect is again absolutely illogical does not make sense at all now i want you to dig a little deeper into the context of the sentence and tell me what can lead to the rendering of rangeland worthless think about it which two pieces of information can we connect to talk about rain, rendering rangeland worthless invasion by ls displacing grasses and cattle two of you have given me actually now the number has gone up so four of you are actually telling me that displacing grasses and cattle food will make that happen and you are absolutely correct why think about it from a very rational point if leafy spurge displaces grasses and other cattle food what will happen is that the cattle will not go to those places to eat leafy spurge because leafy spurge contains milky sap that gives mouth sores to cattle and nobody likes physical discomfort and that's very 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 given even if that information is not there so if in the if in the rangeland the cattle food has been displaced by leafy spurge automatically those rangeland will become useless because now the cattle will not go there to eat eat leafy spurge because eating eating leafy spurge will give them mouth sore because of the milky sap that is present inside the leafy spurge is uh, okay are you able to follow this logic that i just explained the poll is open tell me does that make sense that of course if if the leafy spurge is displacing all the cattle food very look at the preciseness of expressions that the author has used or that the author has employed in writing this sentence so that we can even if so much information is not there we are able to deduce all those pieces of information logically and then you know think about this whole scenario and visualize it all in our head to understand the intended meaning so if you know if the leafy spurge is displacing grasses and cattle food most definitely those rangeland where the cattle food is grown will become useless because cattle will not come there to eat leafy spurge because eating leafy spurge will give them mouth sore because of the milky sap inside the leafy spurge as simple as that so most definitely there is an error in this 
sentence. Huge logical error. If you ask me, Shraddha, is there any grammatical error in the sentence? Really, no. Because comma plus verb ing modifiers, two effects are connected by and, no issues at all. All the subjects have their verb. And you know everything is falling very, very nicely, very, very neatly in this sentence in terms of grammar. But where it fails to work is the meaning part of it. And we understand that this action of displacement has to be connected with herbaceous plant or leafy spurge, any which one, because they are the same in the context of the sentence. And we understand that it is the leafy spurge that does the action of displacing grasses. And then the action of displacement will lead to this effect. So this should be presented as the cause and this should be presented as the effect in the sentence. Okay. Now that we understand the logic of this sentence so well and the grammar also, Let's take a look at the answer choices. And choice B indeed is the correct answer. Now I see that most of you did make the correct on, did land up on choice B, which is the correct answer. But my, frankly, my guess is that the other answer choices do have very blatant, uh, blatant errors that actually steer us towards choice B. But from this point on, I'm 100% sure that you can teach this sentence to anybody, absolutely anybody, purely on the basis of the meaning, on the logic, because now you understand exactly what's going on in this sentence. And you will appreciate you know, the effort that goes in in creating such beautiful official questions that enhances and bolsters our learning so, so very much. So let's take a look at the correct answer choice here. About 5 million acres in the US have been invaded by leafy spurge, a herbaceous plant from Eurasia with milky sap that gives mouth sores to cattle. Okay, that gives mouth sores to cattle. I'll just draw your attention to the structure of the sentence a little bit. You know, when you look at the original sentence with milky sap, it is not, you know, it is not enclosed between two commas, right? There is nothing restricting the movement of other entities with respect to this particular entity in the sentence. But that structure has been changed in choice B, right? Because now we see that with milky sap is placed between two commas. With this kind of a structure, it frees up the movement of that. That can now jump up and refer to a herbaceous plant. In EGMAT terms, we called it a far away noun modification. There are so many instances in official questions where you will see that generally people talk about the touch rule with noun modifiers. It is still the touch rule, but the application is rather a little more broadened here. So we'll talk about that. We have article on GMAT club by the same name. Noun modifiers can modify far away nouns. You can go through it, go through it or maybe you've already gone through it. So you know that this concept exists and that is what is happening in this sentence. So that here is talking about a herbaceous plant. So what is this sentence saying? Uh, the herbaceous plant or leafy spurge gives mouth sores. It is the leafy spurge that displaces grasses and other cattle food, which absolutely makes sense. One kind of vegetation displaces other kind of vegetation. And the result of this displacement is that the rangeland or the grazing grounds become useless. And everything falls in place in this sentence. Now, at this point in time, and I think that, you know, many of you may have this question that you say that, hey, listen, you talk about meaning, meaning, uh, you know, don't change the meaning and stuff. Yes, we do talk about that. But choice A is saying that milky sap gives mouth sore. But in choice B, you're saying that it is telling us that leafy spurge is giving mouth sore. My question to you is, 
is there really a meaning change if i say that milky sap gives mouth sore or the leafy spurge gives mouth sore think about it those who are saying yes tell me how is it different how how is the meaning changing leafy does milky sap appear separately from leafy spurge but we are not talking about any other thing that can have milky sap we need to stick to the scope of the sentence the sentence is specifically talking about only leafy spurge and nothing else and so it is saying that it is the leafy spurge that leafy spurge that has milky sap so if we are talking about the milky sap we are talking about milky sap in the context of leafy spurge that is mentioned in the sentence but think about it does milky sap appear separately from leafy spurge or let me ask you this question okay let me ask you this question if the cattle eat leafy spurge will they not get will they not get uh, mouth sores yes or no if the cattle eat leafy spurge will they get mouth sores yes or no yes right why because it is the leafy spurge that contains milky sap it is not that they can lick the milky sap from somewhere else to have that mouth sore if they eat leafy spurge automatically they will get mouth sores because the leafy spurge contains the milky sap so whether it is the leafy spurge that gives mouth sores or it is the milky sap inside the living a uh, leafy spurge that gives mouth sores means one and the same so even if this sentence is saying that leafy spurge gives mouth sores that's not wrong because you know of course we are getting little technical here right that okay it is the milky sap inside the mouth uh, inside the leafy spurge that gives mouth sore but you know from from a broader perspective we can always say that it is the leafy spurge that gives mouth sore so absolutely no change in meaning what so ever so choice b it does not at all mangle the intended meaning of the sentence rather it enhances and presents the logical meaning of the sentence so this is the this is uh, the um, article that we are talking about we wrote it back in 2012 you know 10 years back we were telling telling people that hey something like this exists so make sure that you know you take advantage of this this article it's there on gmat club just type noun modifiers can modify far away noun in egmat and it will show it up to you and you will see in the same thread you will see the number of questions that have been discussed that actually uses uh, th that actually use this this structure it's a very common structure in um in uh, official questions in terms of your sc questions and i have you know two of them right on the screen but there are a plethora of them so yeah it it will be a nice learning for you so choice b indeed is the correct answer choice c what's the problem with choice c here again having milky sap is an open open descri descriptor no commas here so that again is talking about milky sap so this is fine that milky sap gives mouth sores to cattle yes of course we are breaking it down getting little technical what is having talking about having is talking about a herbaceous plant what is displacing talking about displacing also is talking about herbaceous plant so yeah these two entities look parallel because they both are talking about herbaceous plant and yes of course we know that displacing this action should be uh associated with a herbaceous plant but the problem here is that having milky sap is a characteristic or a feature of herb of leafy spurge but displacing grasses is an action that the leafy spurge does and so in terms of uh, you know similarity these two are not on the same level and because one is a feature and the other is an action 
they cannot be made parallel. So although they look grammatically parallel, they are not parallel because they are not performing the same function. And of course, we have this issue uh, with comma plus verb ing rendering part. We don't know what it is talking about right now because we need a, a proper verb or a proper clause before this comma plus verb ing modifier for a a logical modification so the meaning error is there and of course the grammatical error is also there in choice d now uh, sorry c now let's do let's take a look at choice d the most blatant error in choice d which you should have all identified is that there is no verb for this subject uh, uh sorry five million acres why because have been invaded has now been changed into having been invaded, which is not a verb anymore. So we have a single subject here with no verb whatsoever. So that's the most blatant error that we have in this choice. Next, that is talking about milky sap. So what are the pieces of information that we are getting here? Milky sap gives mouth source to cattle. Yes, I agree to that. That's logical. Milky sap displaces grasses and other cattle food. Most definitely not. Not possible. Milky sap makes or renders rangeland worthless. Absolutely not. Although the list look parallel. Yes, no doubt about that, that the list looks parallel. But it's absolutely illogical. And definitely we have that missing verb error in choice D, which is again repeated in choice A. E, because once again, we have having been invaded and not have been invaded. And because of this expression, now my subject over here does not have a verb. And that's my error. And then again, you know, the, the structure of this or the meaning rather, let me say it this way, that the meaning presented by choice E is very similar to choice D because giving mouth sore is talking about milky sap, which again, I agree to that. Yes, milky sap gives mouth sores to cattle. But this choice is also saying that milky sap displaces grasses and other cattle food, which of course we do not agree to. And then once again, we have comma plus verb by ng modifier just hanging in like that. And that is not correct because it's not connecting with anything in this sentence. So long story short, choice B is the correct answer. And I'm 100% sure that now you understand each and every logical aspect of this question that actually brings us to choice B for the correct answer. I hope that today, whatever we we studied together has some, it, it had some learning for you and uh, you, you are taking something uh, with you from this session. Now, just a quick observation, 85%, a huge chunk of the sentence was underlined. But again, we could not rely on the splits because really that with milky sap inside the comma, outside the comma, the... The list kept changing. So, of course, we could not rely on that. But only with the tool of logical analysis, we could crack this sentence. I seriously want you to go out and, you know, just teach this sentence to somebody from this meaning perspective, with this meaning-based approach. And you yourself will have tremendous amount of um, you know, liking and appreciation for this meaning-based approach and how important it is to, again, logically deal with things. Why? Because as I said earlier, we first conceive of a logic and then we decide on the words as to how we should express it. All right. So with this, my time with you is over. Trust me, I had a wonderful time with all of you solving all these four official questions. I hope the same uh, same for you that you guys also had a good time sitting here for over two hours now. And, uh, you know, and I hope that there was some learning for you from this session. So with this, I conclude my part here. Thank you so very much. And I invite Rajat into the session for the conclusion. Thank you, guys. Rajat, over to you.
Um, let's see. Uh, can you guys hear me clearly? I think I have, you have a short answer pod over here. If you could just put your answers in, uh, maybe open this poll. If you can put those answers in, that'd be uh, wonderful. Perfect. That's good. That's always something that I like to hear. So um, let's kind of start with you. Have about uh, about seventy odd folks here in the session. What were your What were your key takeaways? And, and uh, Karutika, we had a critical reasoning session uh, just just recently. And I saw a couple of you were raising hands. Uh, so I think let's just get those key takeaways in there. And and, and then we're going to talk about some next steps. So what were your key takeaways? Sometimes there are multiple issues. Yes. What else? I mean, what are you going to change post this session um, in terms of how you approach uh, GMAT's intense correction? Okay. Uh, you can put those answers on the right in the on, on the on the on the right side pod, um, not in the Q and A pod. But uh, Akash, thank you. And if you're looking, f okay, uh, something that the meaning is better than uh, much much more important than grammar, meaning and logic, meaning approach to SC gives you more clarity. That's good. Uh, I'll take more time on practice questions that I can analyze. That's one of the best things I can I can really recommend. Uh, uh, uh not changing the meaning after covering logical meaning tense is important that's kind of the next level of understanding that's good all right let's get get a few more insights and, and and the beauty of this is you can see as more and more people are putting things in i'm hoping that those who are reading this are also they also benefit from this So okay, detail analysis. That's good. Um, so that's 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 all really good. I'm gonna clear this because I think we've all read this. I want to ask you, what is it that you wanna you should do next? What would you do next as the immediate next steps? Okay, practice. What else? Practice. Practice. It's good to see mock tests. All right. Look at chunks of sentences to solve more questions. Internalize the meaning-based approach. I like that piece the best. You know, I want you to make sure that you internalize the meaning-based approach and to do this, take a look at the free trial. That's kind of what I would say. That's where you'd look at the verb ing modifier concepts. You'd look at uh, 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 concepts on, on, on verb ed phrases and modifiers. So, so just... I think build that foundation. So you you saw the meaning based approach, and I understand you all are very excited uh, about it. But but it it's just I mean it's you know we don't go from zero to sixty or zero to hundred right off off the bat. We need to build that approach to be able to apply it consistently so that our practice scores are are are, are good. So that's kind of where build the right foundation. Go take a look at the mock. Uh, uh, take a look at the free trial, and 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 then you know so that that's meaning based approach is solidified. Okay, that's something that that I would say. So Yash has a great question. I'm going to just take your question, Yash, in about 15 minutes or so. Um, so we've already and 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 the impact of meaning based approach and Yash, I think you would probably uh, associate with with this this data point here. So we we had one of our former students who very very bright guy. This guy actually was an IDES officer. Um, uh, he also was a doctor. So he was really good with competitive exams. But when it came to the GMAT first attempt, he got a 660. Why? Because, you know, he was focused on learning the rules and he was focused on practicing a lot. He wasn't following the meaning-based approach. And then as he went towards the meaning-based approach, you know, uh, and, and the problem really was, you know, as he would practice questions, especially with hard questions, this is what his brain would tell him. He would be confused between multiple answer choices. I'm sure some of you have been practicing a lot and, and I'm sure you have because you're saying, I'm going to practice next have experienced this where your brain says hey this is right that is right there's no clear reason why to reject hard questions and 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 so that's when he started using the meaning based approach and as 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 he started using it he was able to see as he said the genesis of his intense he was able to see the various appendages i mean you can see the the medical background coming through in his writing 
and 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 he was able to go from a v32 to a v42 uh, the guy got into Kellogg. The guy got into I.M. Ahmedabad um, because he's an IDES officer. He's studying in in India. Okay. Uh, Jim, one of uh, our, our other former students, who's currently studying at Booth. Um, same thing. I mean, he was at a 60th percentile um, a native speaker of of, of English. Uh, he's a Chinese Canadian, and 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 wasn't able to improve beyond the 60th percentile. And 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 for him, started using a meaning based approach. In 20 days, he went from a, a 65th percentile. To a 94th percentile, uh, got a 770. And of course, we'll talk about booth as well. And again, you know, some of you may think this takes longer. The moment you internalize this, you'd be able to solve hard questions. Medium, much faster, but hard in about 90 seconds, which I think is excellent with, with very high accuracy, that is. And this is why, you know, if you look at a performance in 2021 and, you know, the, 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 the prior year that we have to compare, and you look at the number of 700 plus scores reported on GMAT Club, you'll see the total number of scores reported for each GMAT versus those reported for other prep companies. It, it is the approaches, it is the focus on learning these fundamental skills that leads to success on, on, on GMAT Club, um, and, or rather on the GMAT, not GMAT Club. Uh, or so, and, and and so I think really, really important to say, you know, these methods may seem, hey, they're very, very detailed, they, they take a lot longer, but they do deliver results or so. And not just in quant, even in verbal as well, we have a verbal session, a uh, quant session tomorrow. And um, and a lot of you know us for, for verbal, but if you look at data from 2021, um, ever since our launch of quant to auto product, we've accounted for more Q49 plus scores than pretty much everyone else combined has. Um, as well, and the reason for that is the focus on methods, and, and and essentially, you know, we've invented most of the methods that exist. So the meaning-based approach was invented by a co-founder, uh, co Pyle Tundon. Um, um, similarly, she invented reading strategies in RC as well, and then process skills in quant. Um, in fact, if you go look at instructor rating on GMAT Club, even though we haven't been active for the last three years, Pyle, um, myself, and Shraddha are still the top three instructors. Um, not one of the top instructors, but the top three instructors where Pyle is, is number one. Okay. Um, so the other piece which, which I want to make sure that you focus on is, and then some of you alluded to this, is focusing on learning sentence structures. When you think about you know a long sentence, a complex sentence, a sentence that expresses a sophisticated meaning, um, even though it may not be super long, if it expresses a sophisticated meaning, you it has at least two sentence structures. And it's a combination of sentence structures, which means the meaning that each structure um, individually uh, uh, communicates and how it links to the other structure that leads to, to that, uh, what I call a logical and sophisticated meaning. Understand how that happens. If you understand how that happens, you'd be able to point out the errors, the logical errors, and the grammatical errors in those structures, and you'd be able to correct them a lot better. Okay. Um, now, to do this, as I said, you know, you can go start practicing, but the core thing over here is to build that right foundation to make sure you follow the right method. We talked about the right method overall. And then even after this, you know, you will have certain weaknesses. You want to make sure that you're refined to perfection over there. And this is where each one of you needs what we call as personalized feedback over here. When you're building the foundation, when you're learning the concepts, you want to make sure you get feedback so that you know that you've learned concepts. When you're learning the method, you get feedback so that you know you have a certain level of, or you've achieved a certain level of consistency while applying these methods. And then once you hit that 70th percentile, you need analytics to figure out wh which areas you lack in, and then you need feedback again to, in to tell you that, uh, that you've actually improved on those areas and achieved that 90th percentile. So if you've not seen, go to our, our, our homepage, look at how we give 500 points of personalized feedback to every student um, on, on, on our platform and how that personalized feedback leads to success. Um, here's some illustration over here. This is the simplest module on the EGMAT platform. And, um, and and this simple module, I mean, the subject verb is probably our most simple module. You can really see how we give feedback. When you think about the score over here, this 100%, this is not file completion. That is the stick over here. This is actually the person's performance. This is, this is the tracker that puts that's put in here that tracks your performance. And, 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 uh, and it tells you that you've learned this well, so you can go on to the next file. Over here, you see that this, this time is not the length of the file. It's the time that this person has spent so we you know this file is 
not just an MPEG-4 video, it actually is an interactive video, which, which, which means that the person has to interact with it, and if the person doesn't, uh, uh, then then uh, then the file doesn't move forward. So it keeps you um, active while learning. Um, so here's some here's how this helps. Um, you can see in the subject web application file, this guy's code low. So the file gave him feedback to to revise. He revised that. That's why you see the time spent over here is about forty seven minutes. And because of which, right off the bat, because he had those lessons inculcated, he was able to score well on the practice quiz, indicating that he had internalized this. Okay. Uh, same thing in, in verb tenses, you can see that he spent over an hour in verb sequencing, but 50 minutes in, in verbs application. He didn't do as well over here in the practice quiz, but he revised this, and because of which, in the next activity, he got 100%. How do we know he revised this? Because we saw that he bookmarked the questions that, that he got wrong. Again, we track all of this for you overall. And again, the same thing as, uh, as Jim and Rohit said, for him, it's, it was about the meaning-based approach that helped him improve. Uh, he'd taken the test twice, not to use the meaning-based approach, and he was stuck. Once he got started using the meaning-based approach, he was able to improve to that weekly score or so. So with that, what should you do next? Make sure that you take a look at the free trial. See if this makes sense for you. Okay. Now, with that, let me just share the session PDF. Here's a session PDF. You guys can download this PDF. Also, let me share uh, some links um, to, to some, some of the success stories over here. And if you're looking for uh, B-School experiences, make sure you, you click on, um, on, on the second link in this case. Um, okay. uh, there are a few other sessions as well. Okay. Uh, with that, if there's any other question, please put those in the Q&A pod. I'll be happy to address any question that you have. Also, if you're not connected with me on LinkedIn or with Pile on LinkedIn, do connect with us on, um, on LinkedIn. Otherwise, if there are no questions, then all I would say is happy learning. Take a look at the free trial, and I look forward to seeing you um, on ichimat.com and in our session tomorrow. Thank you, Paul.